With over 500,000 trees and shrubs already planted and growing, it's easy to forget you are in the city. We don't just say, we do. It's the Stain City Way. Good afternoon and welcome to Real Talk with me, Annelie Mdoda. So there are so many ways to introduce my guest today. Renowned author, the late great Nadine Gordma once said, Once upon a time, the 1941 Girls of War blew a 13-year-old Greek boy to our shores. He was to become a South African civil rights lawyer of international standing, a devastating cross-examiner of apartheid's torturers and killers. When he won a case during the apartheid era, during the transition, after its end in the early 1990s, and now as we approach our second universal franchise election, it was not and is not just a professional victory, but an imperative of a man who de whose deep commitment to human rights guides his skills and directs his life. So I first met him uh, in my early 20s. He'd just written the book, No One to Blame, and I just recently read it. And I ran into him and I had the book and I stalked him down at the 702 Studios and he signed the book. So it is an honor today for me to have advocate George Bezos as a guest this afternoon on Real Talk. And this time around, you have got this monster of a book. Uh, and you say to me, it took you a few years to write it. Yes. Not full time. <laughs> okay. I was practicing and did it during weekends. Uh, uh, so if you took it over a few weekends, that I, I'd say then it took you three years to do this with like a good probably. 50, yeah, with a good 55 weekends. And your family, would you just shut them out on the weekend and be like, I don't want to hear anything from you guys, I'm writing? I had a study, uh -huh. small room, uh, overlooking the garden, uh, and uh, I worked at it. Okay, so let's, let's work backwards, all the way to when you were 13 years old and you and your father and uh, a few Allied soldiers had to flee to make your way to South Africa because of the situation of World War II that was happening. You know, the night you left, can, as a, can you remember your emotions that you were feeling as a 13 year old? Yeah, well, I was 14 actually. Oh, good, not that young <laughs> my then. Father, my father, when we got to Egypt, uh, took a year off thinking that uh, <laughs> they made me, uh, make me fight in the war. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I was 14. Uh, the schools had closed uh, six months before. Uh. Uh, and I was at a village and the shepherd came to my father, who had been mayor uh. of the village, but he was kicked out of office when, the, yes. uh, when a dictator took over in 36. But uh, he was appreciative of the allies uh. coming to Greece to stop the Italians, which they did very well, but couldn't stop the Germans, the Germans from occupying Greece. Um, and I read in your book that you said your mom and your grandmother and your entire family didn't want you to leave with your dad and you said you will swim behind that boat if they don't leave, let you leave with your dad. Did you and your dad have a very strong bond? My father and I had a strong bond. Uh, I was my grandfather's first grandchild. Favorite. And uh, my grandfather actually said to my father, if you want to go and drown yourself, do it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't take my grandson with But my father was quite smart. Oh. He actually told my, my grandfather, mm. you know what the Turks did with Greek children. They would take them and put them in a new religion and yeah. And, uh, and soldiers. The, Germans may do the same. I have to save these seven uh, uh, soldiers who came here uh. to fight the, uh, the, our enemies. And uh, 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 I, 
I must take him with me uh. because of the threat that I, that I made. My father accepted the reason given by my father. Why South Africa? How, I mean, I know you, 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 you transitioned and you were on a boat and then you got to a country and then you travel. But why was South Africa the end goal for you and your family? We well, were picked up by HMS Kimberley of the British Navy mm. in the middle of the Mediterranean. We were going to Crete without knowing that Greek, Crete was busy falling. As well. And in the horizon, there were 16 warships of mm. the British Navy. Uh, one of the uh, New Zealand soldiers took out a small mirror from his pocket sent an uh, SOS yeah. and one of the 16 ships that were going from, we learned from, uh, 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 from Malta and the Straits, yeah. uh, an SOS and one of the ships, HMS Kimberley. Picked you up to, to South Africa? No, they said Egypt. Okay, okay. We, got to Egypt and uh, the uh, Greek consul uh. in, in exile, a woman, uh. said uh, that uh, the camp that my father was going to go to was not good enough uh, for children of my age. A 13-year-old. <laughs> a 13-year-old. And uh, that she was uh, a member of the committee of the Greek uh, uh, orphanage. Yeah. She would look after me. <laughs> My father could go to Cairo uh. and I would stay in Alexandria. But we only stayed uh, for three months uh. because Romo, the great general of Germany yeah. was 50 miles uh, out of Cairo. And looking. And uh, the, uh, the, the Middle East Command uh. Uh, evacuated uh, refugees from Greece. Uh. Uh, 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 given a choice, uh. South Africa or India, my father was told that in South Africa you can pick the gold and diamonds on the pavement. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, we were brought in grand style on the Ile de France, the island of France, the uh. second biggest ship that had left France before it fell and became a warship. Uh, 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 ship not fighting, but mm. transporting the soldiers. Okay. And, uh, we traveled first class to Durban. <laughs> and that's where you arrived. What fascinated me also in the book, you said that the night before you left, your grandfather slaughtered a, a lamb for you guys and he cleaned the shoulder, the shoulder bone and he held it up to the light and he, and he had a bit of a ceremony for you guys so for you to be safe. Is that something you still do now? Because I mean, us as black South Africans, we slaughter sheep all the time when there's a big occasion like that. Well, you know, my, my grandfather was very disappointed that we were going, Aww. but uh, he actually uh, asked my grandmother and my mother to prepare a sheep. Mm. And uh, what you what they do is that they take the one of the bones, mm. clean it, and hold it up in the light, and it's my grandfather read that it would be a successful thing. Go with my blessing. Uh. Oh, and he wasn't wrong. Listen, time for a quick ad break. Uh, more when we return. I want to find out how he learned English because when he landed in South Africa, he did not speak a word of English and here he sits as advocate, George Bezos. Uh, don't you forget about our weekly competition and e-gift card with 5,000 Rand up for grabs. Detail on your screen as we speak. We'll be right back with this man, advocate George Bezos.
and welcome back to Real Talk. My guest today is a legal giant, human rights lawyer, advocate George Bezos. What a history lesson that is happening here for us today. You have to stay tuned. So you get to South Africa and you don't speak a word of English. Uh, how do you adapt to the situation in the country then? My father was given a job on ISCO because it made war material. Oh, ISCO, the steel place? Uh, for the steel place. Okay. Mm. And uh, he asked where is the nearest uh, high school, and it was Pretoria Boys. I went there for three days to Standard 6. I had already passed Standard 6 in Greece. Yeah. And uh, my father was called in with a Greek interpreter and told, unfortunately, I couldn't understand anything and couldn't speak English. The Park Town Boys was not for me. Try and find something else. Uh -huh. My father heard, learned that there was a Christian organization in Johannesburg and he could place me there. We had an interpreter, a shopkeeper near the Jeppe place. Yes. And uh, uh, the interpreter uh, interpreted for us at the uh, orphanage. Oh. And the answer was, he's too young. We only take 18 plus, so he can't. So then that's when you found yourself working in the shop? In the shop. How did you end up in the newspaper? Because I know you and your dad were in a newspaper that, and you were wearing a cap and he was standing next to you. And that's how Cecilia found you. Why were you in the newspaper? Uh, I think that uh, one of the learned people of the group of 45 probably told uh, the story to uh, Oh, to the to the Sunday Times that you guys had escaped from Greece yes, and, because of the and, war, and also that we helped the Allied soldiers, oh. and uh, the uh, the uh, reporter from the Sunday Times came with a Greek interpreter, and he had uh, 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 oh, an interview with, with us, you guys. and then all of a sudden. Within months of our arrival, this newspaper article of me with my cap and my father. Uh, so Cecilia then comes to find you at the shop three, that you're working at? Three and a half years later. Really? That long? Yes. Oh, but okay. So she, she didn't come find you then. She was just coming to the shop no, to buy to buy her she, bread and milk. She asked, she saw me, she looked at me, looked at me again. I said, are you the boy whose father brought you here and the as a refugee? Yeah. Yes. What school do you go? I don't go to school. What? I am a teacher. Uh, Make sure that he's wearing his best on Monday morning. It was on a Friday afternoon. I'm coming to fetch him. I'm a teacher at Malvern Junior High. Mm -mm. I am going to take him over and you make sure that you buy him a uniform. But now, obviously, because you've been working in the shop, right, your English had gotten had, better. So yes. you, you, you could grab there, there and there. Yes. So are you excited that, oh, OK, finally I'm going to school? I was because uh, it struck me that she was uh, so... Uh, interested in me uh. and uh, she actually had all for all practical purposes adopted me. Yes. <laughs> and uh, uh, I'm sure that she pressed the other teachers to promote me from standard six <laughs> to standard seven. <laughs> Called and in a favor. English, English uh, improved. Uh. Uh, I did standard seven and as we were going to break up, uh. She told me that uh, she had become engaged to be married to a man, pharmacist in the Eastern Cape. East London. But, East London. And she had arranged with uh, Frida Greenberg, the yeah. sister of the great judge, at Athlone High, that I should go to grade eight at a 
at yes. Athlon High. At Athlon High. So apparently you went to go and find her again, Cecilia. Um, years later, your, your kids were just like, Dad, you know, this is the person that you have to thank for everything. Why did it take you so long? Were you scared to go to her? Uh, we did meet once or twice yeah. when she came back after her marriage. Uh. But then we lost uh, uh. touch. But uh, what happened was that uh, I asked uh, someone that I knew was a re her relative. Mm. And uh, he gave me her telephone number. Mm. And uh, uh, because I was awarded by the University of Natal, my first doctorate. Your doctorate. And uh, I found, and uh, the helper, probably a, a black woman, uh. said, uh, who's speaking, said, want to speak to Miss Feinstein. She's not here, but who's speaking? And I said, George Bezos, I'd like to speak to her because I wanted to invite her to Oh, that to your town, function. To the function where I was given uh, uh, your uh, first doctorate. Your dad wanted you to study medicine, though. Yes. And you studied law. Was that a like a, a like was it friction or did were you like was he like medicine you like law and he's like okay. Well, I applied to go to medical school. Oh, but I didn't get in. <laughs> <laughs> I was not a good student. I got an E in English. What did you get for maths? I think that's all that matters. Uh, I, I think a D or something ah, like you'll that. You'll never get in. <laughs> and I turned up to the secretary, again a woman, uh. of the Wurz Medical School, and I said, what do I do? And she said, uh, look your box or not. I know from what you tell me of your background. Mm. Why don't you go to Wits and do a year in the art school? In the art school? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, 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 or Bachelor of Arts. Bachelor oh, of okay, Arts. Okay, so law. And uh, if you do well, apply again for the... Okay. I took the advice. Mm. And I took, not four, Six subjects. Feeling brave, huh? Feeling brave. Mm. But you've got to be lucky. <laughs> I got an E in English and an E in Afrikaans. And uh, I had to write English in order to get into the arts faculty. Yes. We had, a, before the examination, the supplementary examination, the English mistress at Wits had a lesson mm -hmm. with a poem which I will not forget. Margaret, are you grieving mm -hmm. over grove and love? Uh, 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 over Rose uh, and leafing. Mm. Mark held. It's so a you had to recite the poem. You had to. We do the, did the whole thing on the poem <laughs> as a, 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 a as sonnet. a sonnet. Yeah. Oh. As oh. a sonnet. So the, I wrote the exam in English, and, supplementary. And you got it right, and you got into law. Why? Because. There was the poem reproduced on the paper <laughs> <laughs> with the <laughs> and discuss. Okay. I got a B for <laughs> from E to B. <laughs> from E to B. Okay, so now he's in Vitz, and then Vitz obviously unlocks so much more. This is where he picks politics as a way that he's going to go. This is where he meets people like Nelson Mandela. We are speaking to one of the architects of democracy in South Africa. We will be back in a moment with George Bezos.
and welcome back. You're watching Real Talk on SABC3. The stage is yours. My guest today, human rights lawyer, advocate, George Bezos. If needs be, we'll talk about that later. I want to talk about your mother. Um, in the book, uh, you say that uh, at, you know, she wasn't allowed to go to school. Only boys were allowed to go to school because they said that they didn't want girls to be meeting and talking to boys at school. But she also says that the, the girls then worked in the fields, which was even easier to meet boys. So, <laughs> well, <that's first> part. <laughs> so the theory of them keeping away uh, from the boys didn't work. Uh, do you know where your parents met? Uh, it was an arranged marriage. Ah. Uh, by paternal grandfather had another son who was killed in 1917 okay. in the war, the First World War. Oh. His, my father was his second son and one daughter. And he was very anxious for his son to get married. Yeah, and he was like, here you go. And uh, the two fathers arranged the dowry and there was a, a marriage. And there was a marriage. And I was the first child. So take me to the day you were in a tram and you see a lovely lady by the name of Aretha. Areti. Areti. Yeah. There you go. So you're in a tram, you see her, there's lots of space in the tram, and you decide, it's fine, there's, there's lots of room, I'm gonna, I, but I'm going to go sit next to her. She had two Greek books on her seat. And uh, very pretty. Uh -huh. uh, went, picked up the books, sat next to her. <laughs> For what? <laughs> and uh, Just I asked her if she was Greek, and she said yes. She said, it was a Saturday morning. She had a Greek lessons every Saturday morning, but she, she was at the prime at the great uh, English school, uh, mm. uh, and she was in matric, and I was a first year student. Okay, I like it. So, uh, I didn't get off. <laughs> Accompanied her to her home in Troivo. Mm -hmm. We became friends. Uh, and then she introduced me to her mother. Yeah, oh, you're a student. My son is weak in mathematics. Why don't you pop in and do a little bit of her work? With oh, her? that's how you got in, the tutor. <laughs> oh. yeah. And uh, it took a long time. We only got married. This was 48. We only got married in... Uh, uh, 54. Okay. But uh, her f family was not a rich family. She and I wanted a simple wedding, but her mother said, not my daughter. Oh. I want a wedding of weddings. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was a very happy marriage. Three sons. 50 years, actually more than 50 years later. Yeah. And, and then they all got married. And this is the thing, because you, you knew your parents and you guys are an example, and you've got three sons who are also all married. What's the one lesson about love that you, you hope that they've seen from you without you having to say it? You hope that they've seen from you and Arita? Well, falling in love uh, can't be described in simple words. Uh, uh, we became very friendly. We used to go to the cinema together. Uh, her mother, for a Greek mother, was quite liberal. Uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, she actually said to me that she trusted me. But people in the uh, community, saw us walking arm in arm. They're like, yeah! And they, they came to her and they said, hey, be careful, you know, he's a student. You don't know what he's <laughs> going to do. Uh, you better watch your daughter. <laughs> but uh, 
she said she trusted me and uh, I, I was living alone in a single room. My father was in Pretoria, I was in Johannesburg and uh, I had some very good meals at the, my mother-in-law to be. Clever, <laughs> clever. Some for the mom's cooking. You know how your cooking is going to be when you marry her. <laughs> oh yes, absolutely. <laughs> so, is that what you want your kids to know? That falling in love, you don't describe it. You just you do it. You do it. You do it. And you must be, and you must be uh, reasonably uh, convinced that you are in love. Uh. And, and it worked out. Hey, look, didn't turn out too badly. Six, the grandfather of six grandchildren. Uh-huh. So, politics, your family, two of your greatest loves. Did you ever feel like politics is your one love, which is politics, is putting your other love, which is your family, in danger? The interest in politics yeah. was actually started in uh, uh, the grade uh, 8, 9 and 10 for me. Oh. Oh. It was the end of the war mm -hmm. to end all wars. End all wars. I was a student at Wits. In 1948, we didn't expect Dr. Balan to win the election in May 1948. It came as a shock to me at Wits University, where I had started in February. Uh. A member of parliament in June, shortly after the victory of the Nationalist Party, a member of parliament said, what is going on at this Fitz University where black and white sit in the same room mm. and black boys walk with white girls hand in hand? This is completely against our policy. And Mr. Prime Minister Milan, what are you going to do about it? Dr. Milan said that he had been in touch with the authorities at the university and that he was told, unfortunately, there was a small group of leftists at the university that were responsible for that sort of affair. And you were part of the group of leftists? I made a speech the next day in the Great Hall. <laughs> I was four years older than the average first year student. Uh -huh. A refugee. An admirer of the Allies. I believed that this was a war to end all wars and that all people, whether they blacks, this, that, or yeah. the other, Indians, Greeks, they were all human beings. And I finished my short speech. If wanting black students to be treated properly makes me a leftist. I'm proud to be one. You applause in the <laughs> great hall, except for a man called Wasserman, who was the, the representative of the uh, council, representative council, uh, who had a bugle, uh -huh. <laughs> and every time he didn't like something, he'd, he'd make a noise. <laughs> he would make a, a noise. But anyway, this is what I said uh -huh. the next morning in the Transvaal, the leading newspaper of the Africana 
uh, party and the government. Mm. Front page in Afrikaans, links hasn't and trots darab. Left us and proud about it. Okay, we're going to so take So said, it is so had in a George Bezos gesture. Oh, okay. I want to talk all about this because now there's two speeches that you then you're a part of. The one that you made in the Great Hall and the one that Nelson Mandela made during the, the Rivonia trial and you advised them on it. Time for a quick ad break. When we come back quickly, we'll talk about that speech and his relationship with his dear, dear friend, Nelson Mandela. Welcome back and what a joy this is. You and I are basking in the reservoir of knowledge that is advocate George Bezos. And you were telling us about your speech that you gave in the Great Hall at Vist that actually got you a bit of notoriety because the next day you were in the paper uh, with the Transvaal uh, newspaper saying, you know, proud of being leftist, says, ad uh, says George Bezos. Now here's another speech that made a lot of news and you were a part of. Um, Nelson Mandela, this is the struggle of the African people inspired by their own suffering and experience. It is a struggle for the right to live. I have cherished the ideal of a democratic and free society in which all persons live together in harmony and with equal opportunity. It is an ideal which I hope to live for and achieve, but if needs be, my Lord, it is an ideal for which I am prepared to die. Now, if needs be, is something that you, you know, he, he read the speech to you and you were like, mm, buddy, let's, let's, let, let's not get ahead of ourselves here. Let's change the wording a bit. Why was it so important for you to change the wording? There was a historical situation in ancient Greece. Uh. When Socrates was convicted, he was asked by the president of the gathering of Athens. What do you suggest the sentence should be? The prosecutor says that you should be sentenced to death. Mm. What do you say we should do with you? I have done no wrong, said Socrates. I have been told you, telling you what is justice and what is law and what is good for the city. But you asked to uh, sentence me to death. I have done no wrong. You should really treat me like an uh, Olympic uh, Olympic uh, uh, runner. Mm. If he comes first, you feed him for you the rest of his life. I have done things for your good. You must treat me like a Olympic winner. He had been sentenced to death by a certain number. Uh. The number increased by one third for his cheek. Oh. And I explained this to Nelson. Oh, and you said, curb, your, curb the, the enthusiasm. Do not be cheeky. Do, 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 do not be, uh, do, do, do not give them an opportunity. To sentence you to, to death. To, 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 to sentence you to death. He asked for it. You want to know, you have said, you want to live and see it, uh, see liberty for, not only for yourself, but for others, which was the other part of the, of the speech. And uh, we had been friends with Nelson and Oliver Tambo. I was there five, between 54 uh, and uh, 64. Mm. Uh, uh, well, uh, one left the country, uh, the other one was jailed. Mm. But uh, I was their favorite counselor, got a lot of work. How did and you meet him? 
Put Nelson. Yes. Dr. Botlane, who was at the speech where I said I'm proud to be. A leftist. <laughs> a leftist. Dr. Botlana was a second or third year in medical school. He told Nelson they were friends and members of the African National Congress because Nelson asked him, who is this guy who is at Matlane, who had become a friend? He said, okay, I'll arrange for us, the three of us, to meet. And uh, we met and we became friends. And you say that when you're not allowed to be somebody's friend, then the appeal of being friends is even greater. Is that what happened with you and Nelson Mandela? And uh, ab absolutely, because he wanted to know what make you, made you make this speech? Uh -huh. It's because I know, and I told him, I saw how black people are treated on the, in Durban from the ship. Short trousers, a vest, dirty vest, mm. no shoes, pulling a loaded rickshaw. Mm. And I thought to myself, what country have we come to? As young as I was. And uh, he actually started telling me about his youth. And uh, we couldn't do things together. The only things that we could do was that there was an Indian restaurant mm. that admitted people, and a Chinese uh, restaurant near the Foster <laughs> a police station, but in the um, basement. Mm. And uh, we would meet there, he as an attorney and I as a young. But also what I think, the first African advocate was Dumanokwe. Mm. Nelson Mandela wanted to be the first, but the the he dean of the faculty prevented him. Uh. I became a friend of uh, Duma mm. at the university. He needed chambers. I said that I would share the room with him. With him. A man called Munich, who became a judge in the Eastern Transkai, said, we don't have uh, enough room for us. He comes and he wants to be at His Majesty's building. Let him go to Soweto and hire a room. There, with his people. What is he doing here? Uh, what, uh, and uh, uh, we short. And uh, he's going to be given a room of his own. Maisel's a very clever man. Mm. They, there were 22 applications before that for one place. I was chosen by Maisel's <laughs> out of the 22. He had arranged with me that I would share with Duba. And when the right winger said, why should he get a room to himself when we have to share? Uh. Maisel said, and who said he'd get a room to himself? Who would share with him, said uh, uh, Munich. Having arranged with me already, uh. Maisel says, let's try and find out if there is any. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Is there anyone? And there you are, Bezos, that's your name, huh? Okay. And we shared chambers until he had to leave the country. So you have a book coming out, uh, 65 Years of Friendship with Nelson Mandela. On the other side of the break, I want to talk about that book and I want to ask him something. What is the biggest misconception people have about Nelson Mandela? He's going to answer it. And for the last time today, we are with advocate George Bezos, who's got a book coming out, hopefully by September, 65 Years of Friendship, dedicated to his very good friend, Nelson Mandela. What is the biggest misconception people had about him? Because, I mean, you know, we see what I he was. I become very angry. 
oh. when young, not very well uh, informed people say that Mandela let the people of South Africa down. Uh -huh. It is false. He didn't do it alone. He had the support of the Walter Susulus and Mbekis of this world. Uh -huh. He had the vast majority of the people of South Africa, black, white, pink, uh -huh. uh, brown, praising him to the sky. He is recognized by the world at large as having avoided a bloodshed uh -huh. between different peoples in South Africa and the statement is so clear that South Africa b belongs to all the people who live on it. He didn't make it up in the early 90s. It's in the F Freedom Charter where he wasn't even present. He was bound and he sat at the back of the ground. The people who say that Nelson Mandela did wrong to any people in South Africa right. have better ask themselves the question after they have been informed of what Nelson Mandela did for all of us as human beings. Mm. Let them read him. Let them read the books about him. Let him see the films that were put together in the United States, in the United Kingdom, in France, whilst he was a prisoner, and then say this incorrect thing that he let the, peoples, the black people of South Africa down. He did not. He will be remembered forever as the maker of South Africa. Speaking of remembering, why is your memory so good? You remember Everything. Except your name. <laughs> it's Anele. <laughs> because I am going to be 90 in no November. Okay, big party. There's a thing called nominal aphasia. Mm. Not remembering names. Mm, okay. Which is a disadvantage. But you remember what happened in the Great Hall at, at Witz in, in, in 1948. There were things that we don't forget. Okay. And uh, uh, I uh, think about the things that did happen, how bad it would have been mm. if, in fact, there was bloodshed. Mm. It was on the wall from the middle 80s that apartheid would last. I was a runner between South Africa, Lusaka, mm. and London mm. on behalf of Nelson Mandela in one of the three jails that he was in because he said he didn't want to do anything to himself. I had to go back and forth, discuss it with Oliver Tamu, and come back and say to Nelson, this is what Oliver said. And said, say to Oliver when I went, this is what Nelson says. He didn't make decisions for himself. Apartheid was at its end from 85 onwards. And uh, many white people, including Afrikaners, saw the writing on the wall and agreed to the constitution, which Arthur Chaskelson, many other lawyers, including myself, wrote, not for any group in South Africa, but for everyone in South Africa. 
Thank you so much for your time. You've got two books, this one and no one to blame. I suggest you go and get it so that you can get this history lesson. And then most importantly, in September, that's 65 Years of Friendship by George Bezos for his friend, Nelson Mandela. You have been such a treat. Thank you for spoiling us. This was what he did. To leave your house and to come here, you were spoiling us in SABC3 and Real Talk. We'd like there to thank you. There is a preface in that book. By Nelson Mandela. Uh, Nelson yeah, Mandela. I know this. I know this. I know that he wrote it. But my book is strange. It's from back to front. I don't understand. <laughs> I don't I don't know. Look, it's from this way. It's from back to front. I know, but we've said goodbye. Sorry. I thought we were gone already. I, I could have said state secrets, guys, eh? We'll see you tomorrow. Bye bye. <laughs>